Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 495 of the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. How am I? Doing the best I can with the time I have available, my friends, my friends. If it's your first time check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please, please share the show. And of course, leave me a five-star review because that would help it get up the algorithm ladder, help people discover a little bit more, make people know that people are listening to it and they're enjoying it and they're, you know, they're, they're flipping gripped by the sound of my voice and the topics I talk about. Please leave a review to reflect the way that you feel about my show one star two star three star four five i don't care believe a review will take you just you know roughly around five minutes to do on your apple podcast app i'd really really appreciate it. and of course support for your patrons welcome to at patreon.com for just agostino you can find the, the link in the show in the description of the show that you listen to or via the podcast app or if you're listening to this via um if you're watching this via youtube you'll find a link on my description it's patreon.com for just agostino you'll find all the links there attach 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 oh sorry subscribe subscribe back 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 on patreon little as one dollar equivalent of one pound per month and you get access to all my bonus content make sure you join on there don't delay get involved today hello how you been i've been good i've been good how have i been i've been awesome i've been awesome i've been all right i'm not gonna lie like i said i'm i'm getting back into the gym i'm feeling good you know the arms are getting back where they should be um you know there's a there's a collarbone showing there a little bit got to just up on the cardio but i'm loving it man like i said before i needed that structure i needed that regime i needed those days to be locked in i needed to have like a, a um a schedule right something don't get me wrong the work thing does help to fight against it but i just think adding the element of being able to stick to like a minimum of a three-day workout plan monday wednesday friday and then now of course add on top of those cardio on the tuesday thursday and saturday so it then equals out to about six days is a great way to go about things especially because you know again i'm working monday to friday i only have a really limited time to make sure i get those workouts in so i can't afford to miss one so that usually leads to me making sure that i'm doing them like you know the past what three weeks or so i haven't missed a single workout so i'm really proud of that and i'm just going to keep going i'm just doing what i was doing prior this is not really that you know crazy i'm not really saying this for pats on the back i was doing this you know before but obviously with um things changing in the way that i you know navigate in the world and the world itself changing in 2019 my kind of um willpower and whatnot kind of waned a little bit my dedication waned and i kind of got a bit lazy and i started you know picking up bad habits and of course you know um the rest is, you know, the rest is history, really. But I'm trying to obviously get back onto that level that I was prior. I'm not going to get back to the crazy level of what I was doing before, where I was literally, legitimately sometimes going to the gym or working out seven days per week, plus going out, plus DJing, plus traveling, plus writing, all this stuff. I was doing too much. I'm going to kind of dial it back a bit. Still, of course, do the things that I love and enjoy to do that bring me some level of joy, especially in this crazy world we live in. But of course, dial back on all the extra stuff just for the sake of being busy because there's no real need for it. So that's been really it I've been up to. Like I said, this weekend, I'm going to Toft Manor to go to um, the Labyrinth Air Arm Dixon. I basically you can call it like an Innovision showcase with Labyrinth that they're hosting a Toft Manor just outside of London. It should be absolutely amazing. We're all going to get a coach all the way up there. It's going to be a vibe. People are going to be, you know, getting on it, having drinks, chatting, you know, having a good time. And then we're going to get to the actual venue itself and have a little boogie in it. So it's going to be absolutely wonderful. I'm not going to say it's going to be wonderful. So before that too, I'm going to record obviously a couple of bits of content. Um, some bits and pieces are obviously stick on the free podcast but most of the stuff i'll have it on the patreon so if you want to get an idea on what that festival what that little mini party is going to be like the day party i think the next day they're actually doing a kind of music one on sunday the same location so that should be pretty sick so if you're curious about seeing that and viewing it make sure you check out my patreon at patreon.com for just agostino you find all the, the the details in there but essentially it's equivalent to one pound one dollar per month you get access to all my content you're able to see all that stuff that's going to be behind a pain wall because some of it might be a bit racy it might be a bit you know so definitely check out the patreon for all that information and i'll definitely endeavor to get all that uploaded hopefully by the sunday if not by the monday at the latest i'm going to do some field recordings and pictures and videos only specifically uploaded for the patreon gang so make sure you jump on the patreon at patreon.com fortress agostino description description for the link description for the link down below check it out check it out anyway moving on 
jam-packed show for you today. Loads of to get into, so grab yourself a drink and a little nibble, whatever it need be, and let's just dive on deep. First things first, interesting news of the day, especially for my fellow Playboy Carty fans out there. Um, the day has finally come where we kind of discovered what this narcissist project was all about, or this narcissist rollout. Essentially, Playboy Carty on Instagram was posting some pretty incredible fits, I have to say, because again, I'm a big fan of Vetema. I'm a big fan of Denmark. And, you know, in my opinion, I still think he's one of the greatest designers of our of our of the modern era, right? I kind of go as far as saying that his run at Vetema was legendary, which led him of of course to get the big gig at Balenciaga now he's left Vetemoff in the last collection might have been 2019 around that mark and he's gone to do bigger bigger and brighter things at Balenciaga obviously reintroducing um Couture the other the other season but um it seems like there's been a bit of a Vetemoff resurgence Playboy Carty posted up some incredible pictures of himself wearing some great archive quote-unquote um Vetemoff pieces kind of um reigniting the love and the appeal of the early Vetema stuff and it was kind of captioned with you know narcissists coming I think 9 13 and um, 21 which obviously is going to be the 13th of September and everyone was kind of thinking it was definitely some sort of music maybe not an album maybe an EP maybe a single but I don't think anybody thought it was going to be what transpired right now and Playboy Carter fans are completely up in arms and I completely understand me myself personally again I followed because, you know, I've got the advantage of being a DJ. So I kind of, by my requisite quote-unquote job or the career or the field of interest I'm in, I have a, a diverse uh, palette of music that I listen to on a daily basis. I've been to Download Festival, which is a really popular metal festival here in the UK. I go to Primavera. I've listened to loads of various different types of music. So with that being said, I'm exposed to different sort of artists who are divas and a bit eccentric and a little bit weird in their own way. So I'm kind of used to this this kind of treatment like this kind of um, ambivalence and somewhat um oh i don't know is it ambivalence what else you call it this somewhat um disregard that playboy carty seems to have for his fans i'm quite used to it but i think a lot of hip-hop fans aren't really used to it especially nowadays in the era where most of your artists are you know just an instagram live away from updating you on their life letting you know what they're doing with their album what it seems what they want to go in their career right most artists do that but for someone like a playboy carty he obviously kind of bucks the trends and does things his own way he doesn't really talk to the media does interviews i think the last round of interviews he did was for was for Die Lit, right? The last round of interviews I think he might have done. Um, he doesn't really do interviews, not even print ones really. Or well, he does print interviews sometimes if they're for like fashion magazines. He does a lot of fashion, you know, posts, of course. He's got that great connection with Matthew Williams at Alix and now at Givenchy. He's rocking head to toe Rick Owen most of the time. He's like a, what they call him, a gay vampire, right? He's a little bit in his own world. So he doesn't really, you know, move to the beat of like, you know, a standard musician would. So, but then at the same token, because everyone assumed that there was music coming out, I think his team and himself kind of owed it to the fans, especially considering his radio silence and considering how many times he delays stuff and it doesn't drop when it's meant to drop. He maybe owed it to the fans when they started to get a bit too excited and get a little bit ahead of themselves to come out and say, hey, what you think this is going to be isn't going to be what it's going to be. It's completely different. But again, in this era that we live in now at the moment, everyone is kind of infected by the viral virus. Everyone loves the attention because it's hard to get. You don't want to pay for it because you're going to be paying through the nose to get that kind of level of attention. Whether it's ads on IG or Facebook or whatever, it's pricey to get people's eyes and ears to pay attention to stuff that you can do. So if you could do it organically without really trying, but just announcing things and posting a couple of fit pics of you wearing a helmet next to a very austere wall, you're definitely going to lap it up. You're not going to clarify anything because you like the attention and it's bringing more eyes to the things that you're going to announce, which might be a letdown regardless but still the fact that they're paying attention is good but i still think he may be owed it to the fans to basically clarify and say hey by the way it's not going to be that i'm not going to say what it's going to be but it's not going to be what you think it's going to be it's not an ep it's not an album it's not any music it's going to be a merch store what it looks like and a tour itself that's what basically the tour is called narcissist tour which is weird considering um his album you know but hey whatever we can we move so this headline here for hip hop dx it says Playboy Carti blames website hackers, fans, clown narcissist merch, including the 5K helmet, right? So if that wasn't bad enough, I think the tour is cool. Um, the idea behind I the word narcissist, I think people, some of the law around Playboy Carti is that that was one of the things that Iggy Azalea basically, um, you know, held him in terms of abuse when they were going through that little spat online. That's something she said about him, or I think she might have said it in like a 
in like one of those kind of what were they called in like a subtweet thing randomly and everyone kind of deduced that it probably was about Playboy Carti so he's obviously taking that moniker and kind of worn it on his chest as as most agent provocateurs usually do right wherever you call them as a sort of um as a sort of uh whatever you hurl at them that's meant to insult them they usually kind of wear it on their chest as a sense of empowerment so he's kind of kind of you know operating from the play, from the county west playbook in that regard but anyway the article says the following the, the fans obviously are not happy about this because again you know it's all well and good doing a tour but then dropping a, a merch line with a 5k helmet that you can get on alibaba is absolutely insane so this is the following playboy carty narcissist which turned out to be merch not new our new album finally arrived on tuesday september the 14th but the hyped up release didn't go as planned for the atlanta rapper or his fans following numerous social media teasers playboy carty online store was updated with what fans were told led to believe was a new narcissist merch collection the racing inspired range included a bomber jacket 200 dollars a hoodie 110 long sleeve 50 and a ski marks 14 motorcycle gloves 75 the piece de resistance of carty's collection was a black motorcycle helmet that came with a hefty 5k price tag now the reason why this is really interesting i know sometimes people have different names for their tours as they have their album but usually there's some kind of tie-in between what they do for their album and what they do for their tour but a whole lot of red i don't really remember there being any kind of hint that it had some sort of racing you know um kind of displays or signage or symbolism anything there wasn't anything about that nothing incognito about the thing at all this new incognito wearing a mask and being a little bit mysterious thing came more so after whole or red whole or red was quite in your face you know action-packed stage um influence pop, pop no stage influence punk right hip-hop influence but what Hip, punk influence hip hop whatever it may be called right is that way around or hip hop influence punk hip hop influence, whatever it may be you never really got the idea that it was most psycho inspired though. Do you know I mean this would have made more sense in die lit as opposed to whole lot of red but you know whatever he continues says however and they got, he got here the collection looks pretty run of the mill just a couple of blanks you know plastered on with some screen printing here and there then maybe the face mask might be a good thing because i think it might be the first time you could buy one of these sort of like kanye s face masks that you can go incognito around in and i really want one so i can go to you know a techno club somewhere and be a little bit incognito i think that would be flipping awesome i'm sure it's not going to be the most comfortable thing to wear in a nightclub but i'll try Article continues, it says, however, one particular observant fan quickly smelled something fishy. He pointed out the pricey helmet listed on Playboy Carter's e-store appeared to be the exact same one used a product image of significantly cheaper a hel metal, sorry, helmet featured on a Chinese retailer. See, I knew that was right. Alibaba. He says, Carter really said, let's get a $29 Chinese motorcycle helmet with a flat logo photoshopped on top for 5k. Fuck them kids, he wrote. The same fan also noticed a 40 pin ski mask from the merch collection used the same photo of a mask retailing for 0 0.545p. Oh, okay, you can get those masks already on Alibaba. Sick. On Alibaba. Okay, I had no idea. So he's got here, he's got, he's showing here that the motorcycle helmet can be purchased on a Chinese um, shop. I'm not sure what it's called. I think it's called Shopee.bw or something along those kind of lines, right? There we go. Shopee.tw. But it's obviously retailed for 5K on there. And then the actual mask. Oh, look, they actually photoshopped it. Look what they've done. So obviously this mask, they're obviously going to maybe make it or edit it. But they've taken the stock image of the mask you can get at Alibaba and just kind of filled it. I guess inside with black, so to make it look like it's one of those um, Yeezy Donda era face mask. That is so horrid, isn't it? The bomber jacket, exact same one you can get. What down to wrinkle from where? The bomber jacket too. To be honest, this is not a surprise. I don't think you're buying merch under the guise that these guys are creating like a little streetwear brand launched thing. If anything, merch has always been a kind of way for you to show appreciation for the artist or album or tour that you listened or you're a fan of or you went to wherever. That's mostly what it is. So if they print a, a cover of the image on the back of a hoodie, on a tote bag, on a flipping mug, on the jacket, on the hat, it doesn't matter really, right? It can be in anything. Now, the difference comes when they try and price it like it's a streetwear line, like it's a fashion line right that's where it gets a bit out of order that's where you're like okay now you're taking a piss um it's all well and good you know again selling your album cover on a bit of merch and giving it to people on different bits of clothing that they might want to wear but then pricing it like it's actually a brand anything is absolutely wild so you know two hundred dollars five thousand dollars for the helmet is nuts maybe a couple of money on top of it to make sure you're covering all your you know screen printing importing delivery stuff fair but you know 
5, 10, 20x the actual price listed that you actually got it, you know, from the factories is insane. It's kind of occupying that Virgil Abloh territory where he did with the rugby flannels, which again is dubious too, isn't it? Is that, is that, is that something that you should be moaning about? If he's the one that goes out and buys these rugby flannels, they then become out, they then become um, dead stock. Oh no, they then become, um, is that archive? Oh no, he basically sells them out. He buys the entire stock of these particular jackets. He prints a thing on them. These jackets are really popular. You can't get them anymore. Then he prices them what he prices at. It's a. It's basically in that respect, it's a seller's market because there's this scarcity of supply. So he can sell it at what he wants. It's scummy, don't get me wrong. It's a little bit immoral, especially when you're for the kids. But the game is a game really, isn't it? Some people shouldn't be that surprised, I think. Oh, it's going to open. I didn't want to open a window. Please open a window. Okay, cool. Let's continue. Is that, where's there any more? I think that might be it, isn't it? Is that it? Is that it? I think that might be. No, it's not. There's more here. It shows again the bomber jacket with Nazis printed on the front chest. Paper Kai posting dates on his Instagram while his fans went crazy thinking it was an album. Only to say nothing on the day and then drop 5k on it. It's got me crying. There, nigga done lost his mind. As more fans began to take notice, the irregularities around the Nazis and merch, Playboy Carti pointed the finger at hackers while claiming he never approved any of the items. He since pulled the merch from his site. So allegedly he's saying that hackers hacked into his site and listed these items on there. But he didn't, which might have some credence to it because that face mask is just, that's just terrible, right? They didn't even try to hide the fact that it was a banner clava they got from Alibaba. They just basically, you know, um, filled in the white bits to make it look like it was one of those Donda masks. That's terrible. So he might be correct, but I smell cap. I'm not going to lie. I smell a big piling stinking doo-doo worth of crap and of cap sorry of crap crap and cap he actually posted a um a status on his twitter on his instagram which is definitely an indication that maybe it is legit because he never posts anything in terms of clarifying or informing his fans it's just here it is it's out listen digest here buy tickets here buy this merch so the fact that he's explaining might mean that he's you know a little bit uh he feels a little bit bad for what's happened but I don't think so. <laughs> to be completely honest, I don't think he does feel bad. <laughs> I think he just kind of operates in his own world and he's probably not even aware of what's going on. This might even be his team. It might not even be something that he's doing himself directly. But let's check it out. It looks like he's changed the profile picture of his, his Twitter too, it looks like. And changed his, um, what do you call it, his name on there too. It's SVJ now. Um, yeah, it says here, this is a conversation between two people. He's doing a Kanye. You can tell he's not behind around Kanye. He's just uploading a screenshot of a of a conversation he had with two people where it says, the website is hacked, the ref folder was posted live, never approved any of the clothing, etc. I don't know who he's talking to, but I guess he's sending a message to somebody to let them know that that, that wasn't true. And then going back to the thing, Paper Kai fans will be resolution. No, Paper Kai fans were hoping for a resolution to the merch mix-up before Nelson's tour kicks off next month. The 43 Cities Arena tour gets underway in Nashville. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. So the question I have to say is that it's really difficult to be a fan of an artist nowadays, especially the ones who kind of adopt this kind of mysterious um, kind of um, persona in their artwork, like a Paper Kai, because essentially you're just having to just... Um, there is no... Um, how would you say there's not like interaction but there's no like give and take it's just like he gives you what he wants to give you and you digest it how you want to digest but there's no kind of sympathy extended to the fans there's no understanding there's no explanations there's no clarifications there's no heads ups it's just whatever i give you this is what you're gonna get and that's it you move on for some artists that would be ideal i think if you're some of the bigger artists and you're having to go and do crazy press runs and stuff you're probably looking at paper car thinking bloody i wish i had that kind of career but he's not that guy right he's not the weekend um so that's so that shouldn't be a bother he has he doesn't have mad press um uh responsibilities that he has to do right he doesn't really have many things that he does outside of music by the looks of it he just kind of concentrates on music and the fashion sort of stuff so if that's the case being able to maybe send out a tweet just to clarify to your fans that like, hey that album you think i'm going to be putting out which you if you know me as an artist you know i'm not going to put out another album so soon after my other one is not coming i'm just you know but be be patient what's going to announce is still going to be fun anyway then at least they know okay stop the music it, whatever else come after they're going to be happy with it and then maybe you wear your merch a couple of times show it off just to kind of of course advertise it some more that is okay but remaining dead silent enjoying all the hype and all the clicks and all the tension it's getting you and then turning around and saying you got hacked is a little bit lame because again we have to believe that a hacker hacked into his site 
not to extract information to post some places that other people do. They kind of, you know, they take flipping leaks of his and sell them and, you know, flip them and put them on Spotify or whatever, right? They do, it's a real, like, little black market um, uh, around Playboy Carti leaks and whatnot. They didn't try and do that. They just went up there and basically uploaded merch that they think would sell well um, according to the artist himself on there. That just doesn't make any sense. Right? I mean, it's hard to believe. It might be true, but it definitely is hard to believe. So it's definitely, it's difficult to be a Playboy Carti fan, but I guess for a lot of people out there, I'll say, as I said, as I'm a fan of many genres and I have a, a lot of artists who I follow who are very obnoxious, insufferable, and a bit of a, and, and it can be cunts at times outside of the music. It's just one of those things you're just going to have to, especially once you get older, you're going to have to decide, can you separate the art from the artist? Can you separate the fact that Playboy Carti seems, seems like a little bit of a prick, right? And he's, but then he does make really good music. And if you're able to do that, you'll be able to enjoy his artistry a lot more because you just go into it purely for the art and you'll know and you won't care about how he treats his missus. You won't care about if he's a deadbeat dad. You won't care if he doesn't update his fans. You won't care about that. You just concentrate directly on the tunes. And that's what maybe you should be doing. Do you know what I mean? Because that's, that's basically what he's presenting himself to the world as. He's not telling you, you know, about himself in private life or what about his, who he is about with his family and stuff. He's presenting to you as Playboy Carti, this kind of enigmatic, mysterious, black hip hop vampire guy and if that's all right with you, that's okay. If not, bound to go to another artist that's willing to kind of open, you know, their diary and let you know and tell you exactly what else is going on in their life, innit? But that's what it is to be a Playboy Carti in flipping 2021, innit? Ups and downs. Um, what else we got here? Yeah, we'll talk briefly about the Man United v Young Boys game that happened the other day. Again, I don't want to go over it too much because it's a it's a broken record at this point. I spent many many hours over the last couple of days, or the over yesterday and the subsequent day, um, on Twitter Spaces, arguing with other fellow United fans and just trying to ration, just trying to understand why exactly we're in this position we're at the moment. But taking into consideration the game itself specifically, I thought it was a fairly mediocre game of football. I thought, if anything, Young Boys probably play the better football they obviously had the more chances i think looking at the stats if i'm not mistaken here we had a very measly two shots on target the entire game even though one of our players only got sent off on the 30th, 35th minute if i'm not mistaken absolutely shocking um so obviously you know young boys definitely came out to spoil our party especially with cristiano's return first game in the, in the champions league away from home big deal blah, blah blah they didn't give a crap and it's more embarrassing because allegedly they started off their domestic season pretty poorly i think they're sitting in fourth place or something right so which is obviously not a good place for them to be considering that they are former champions so the game itself again fairly mediocre game i wasn't that um annoyed with the starting lineup i thought the starting lineup was fairly solid and get up here up in the screen i didn't have any complaints about it a apart from the double pivot that Oli or soul shark seems to pref seems to prefer which i'm not really a big fan of but in general this is what he seems to like how to have to play i thought in preseason we saw van der beek and matic playing at double pivot and they played really well um i thought it would have made more sense to play matic there of course he's getting a bit a bit long in the tooth and maybe Oli wanted to give him a rest but i think in a champions league game away from home you could have easily started with matic and van der beek because they're familiar with playing with each other and maybe their playing styles match a little bit more and then they if one or either got tired, you could easily bring on Fred for the extra legs and a bit of energy in midfield. Easy, right? Again, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I thought that would have been a good decision. The rest of the lineup, I would never have a problem with. Bruno Fernandes playing as a 10. Pogba playing in that kind of floating eight position here on the left. Um, and then, of course, Sancho on the right as a bit of an outlet, maybe connecting a little bit with Ronaldo up top. As the game transpired, though, there wasn't much connection between the front three, it felt like, and Ronaldo. Um, it felt like a little bit disjointed. Obviously, the ball that Bruno Fernandes played to Ronaldo was sublime and obviously one of the better bits of attacking play that we had, but we didn't see enough of it. I did make a comment earlier on in the game that I did think there was maybe up until the 35th minute, it felt like it was Bruno Fernandes's most disciplined performance I've ever seen him play in a Man United shirt, especially in number 10. He didn't go wandering up front. He basically occupied that space in the middle and was on the ball or fairly active in that number 10 position a lot more than he was prior. I thought Fred played pretty decently. I thought Van der Beek was pretty tidy, if not, you know, just not super impressive, but he was tidy when he was on the ball. He didn't lose possession. I think his stats were like 92% uh, 
uh, pass completion. So he was obviously fairly good in that position where you can lose the ball um, pretty easily, especially with the attackers coming to press you in order to kind of break through into the defence. I thought Sancho, of course, side a bit shaky, but still I thought he was maybe coming into a bit of his own. I think the right-hand side connection between him and wan is obviously not the greatest partnership because wan isn't the best going forward and he's passing, short passing is not where it needs to be to make that into to make that basically triangle work. It's not going to work that way with wan well, Obviously, as it transpired, it didn't. And then Luke Shaw on this side and Pogba, I thought were a little bit disjointed too. Um, I thought Pogba started off the game pretty poorly. He played pretty poorly the entire game, really. Um, it seemed like he was getting a hush to, rushed and, and hurried off the ball a lot easier than he has done in the past and just seemed to be kind of off his game. And of course, as soon as we got the goal, I felt like maybe we could settle our nerves and get back into the game. But if anything, we kind of gave the onus back to young boys again. And then their constant pressure and buzzing around and pressing us on the ball eventually led to Mwambasaka miscontrolling a pretty easy bit of a pretty easy pass. Um, and then as he's going to go try to get recover his second touch, he lunges in, catches the guy on Yanko and gets sent off. Easy red card, no arguments there in my opinion. But I still think between the hours, the minutes of 35 to 45 where we weathered the storm and went into the halftime, still 1-0 up, I still think we had enough in the locker between that time all until the end of the game to at worst get a draw. Because of course, you're playing in the Champions League, it's not going to be any gimme, gimme matches, even if you're playing against a Swiss team, an Austrian team, it doesn't matter. They're all going to be fairly decent. They're going to give you problems, especially if they're playing in front of their home crowd after the pandemic and stuff. Everyone's going to be up, especially if you're playing a big team, you're going to want to impress. So it's not like I expect us to win against young boys, but I did expect at the very least maybe to have to concede a last minute equaliser, right? Which would have been a gut blow, but all things considered, we could have dust ourselves off and continue for the next one. But I didn't expect as soon as we came out for the second half for Oli to make an immediate substitution, which I didn't think was necessary, bringing on Varane and taking on Van der Beek. Um, I just didn't think it made much sense because immediately it kind of allowed us to kind of sit back five yards into our own box, which then invited more pressure from young boys. And then we didn't have an out ball in terms of trying to get further up the pitch. So essentially we decided to give up on the game and hope that we could hold on until the end for a draw, or for a win or for a draw. And in the end, again, in the Champions League at this level, you don't really win, get you can't you can't kind of um you can't manage games like that you have to be a bit more purposeful a bit more intentional about what you're trying to do whether it's trying to maybe rejig how the midfield is so you can have better screen in front of the defenders whether it's uh, rejigging who's playing because uh, again i would have said maybe not taking off because again i'm, I'm not a, i don't have a problem with maybe taking off a sancho and bringing on adalo but there may be of an argument to taking off a bruno fernandez and keeping a sancho on for an outlet because bruno pogba fred they don't really have the legs to kind of transition or keep the ball further up the pitch or maybe Pogba maybe does but in terms of just pace they don't really have much of it especially with another up front it would have made more sense to keep a Sancho on maybe taking off a Bruno Fernandes who again number 10 a bit more of a luxury brought on a Dalo. see how that formation or see how we would have been with that with maybe Sancho playing just behind Ronaldo to kind of again uh, maybe compact the midfield a little bit maybe make them a flat four a, fl a flat four or five in front of the defence in terms of Pogba Fred um, Sancho and Van der Beek, All right? And then maybe just have Ronaldo up front on his own. That possibly could have worked in that regard. But I think immediately going for that substitution with Varane, um, it just it just spelled disaster, and we just couldn't handle it again. We don't have we're not defensively um, drilled enough, or no, we're not we're not defensively. Um, astute enough to kind of hold on to those kind of issues because it can be done you have to be cute you have to be a little bit clever you have to maybe you know employ some of the dark arts to kind of get out of that situation but it's not something that we can currently do at this current level that we're currently playing at. it's just not going to happen um so i wasn't really a fan of that substitution that really made no sense to me we continue and of course we can see the equalizer pretty soon no not thinking the 70th minute i think if i'm not mistaken we can see that yeah about the 60th minute um the equalizer was pretty terrible again considering we had three international center backs on the pitch plus our full backs in Dallow and Luke Shaw when the ball goes off out to the wing and before it gets crossed into the box where we concede Luke Shaw is nowhere near whoever's on the wing he's tucked in inside he doesn't see his man out there he hasn't to sprint out to try and block the cross block the cross he doesn't the cross comes in and then bang we're already 1-1 one, one down right oh sorry we're, it's it, it's um it's 1-1 one, one now and quite likely it's going to look like they're going to try and win the game and eventually they did end up winning the game and um to kind of compound things and make it even weirder, the substitutions after that were didn't make much sense after. Do you know what I mean? It didn't really make much sense. Um, from the Nemanja matches signed, the matches um, substitution that probably should have come before um, 
which, which probably should have come way before it did. Maybe it could have come at the same time that that the Dallo came on. Who knows? The Varane substitution, like I said, didn't make much sense. Varane maybe should have played, especially because for continuity, for continued con continuity, whatever it's called, right? You maybe you could have kept Varane on and maybe changed one of the people at the back line. Maybe it's a Dallo for Wan Bissaka, or maybe it's somebody else for left back. I don't really know, but that could have been a far better way to go around things. Maybe Greenwood would could have come on as again a striker to put up front who can maybe have pace on the break to worry the um, young boys defenders because as good as Ronaldo is on the ball he's not going to outrun anybody anytime soon and just in general the in-game management was pretty terrible tactics wise and it raised a lot of interesting questions about United in terms of where we go from here because it's quite clear we have improved every aspect of our club allegedly right if you believe what you believe what you read on online in terms of our recruitment policy we've got a director of football in place which we never had before something United fans have been crying out for myself included um, it seems like we're doing transfers a lot more efficiently now things don't take ages to get concluded as they did prior we've got far better players um, allegedly the coaching staff is kind of improved with the addition of that guy from Chelsea but so far the manager hasn't changed and the same mistakes keep happening the same little errors the same little things that you would expect somebody who's been in management that's all he has been for 10 plus years shouldn't be keep doing at this point so I wonder what when 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 does the time come where United fans say to themselves when will we decide that maybe it's not just a player's fault all the time, which it obviously is in this case. You know, Aaron Wan-Bissaka getting sent off and Lingard giving away the ball for the second goal, which ultimately was the winner. Those are huge mistakes that are definitely going to hurt you, hurt your ability to try and win a game. But I think considering the red card came at the 35th minute and went into half time one nil up, 15 minutes plus or plus stoppage time, we still were able to weather the storm. And the fact that we only conceded those two goals in the second half when we should have been a lot more defensively resolute and kind of um kind of, yeah resolute in terms of what we were trying to do second half that is pretty embarrassing especially when you consider the substitutions that are being made so for me i don't want to be in a position where we have to be in six or in like an arsenal position out of the europe and everything for us to change manager i don't think that's necessary i don't think you always need to be down in the dumps for you to finally realize you know what maybe this guy isn't the guy to take us to the next level which which is evidently true social's done a great job to get us where we are now but in terms of where we want to go he's just not going to be the guy he doesn't have a the quality or the ability to get that done and that's okay but of course the players have to take a huge amount of accountability I think I saw a lot of nervous players out there on the pitch I saw a lot of players who were very aware that we were playing a Champions League game first in the season with Ronaldo in our lineup there was a lot riding on this game they wanted to obviously show out and make a good impression especially considering how um, good the feeling was around the Newcastle game the other week so for sure I saw a lot of nerves and that's why I maintained from the beginning that it was more important for Oli to have won a trophy last season than a club. I don't care if it was a Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, it would have been more important for him to have won a trophy, maybe even more important than finishing top four. Maybe the club wouldn't agree for Oli than it would have been for the club because Oli needs to know that he has the minerals or he has the ability to win a trophy with this team or to win a trophy with a club of this stature. And at the moment, I feel like that lack of belief is kind of emanating and seeping through into the players where they're not quite believing that they can get it done despite the quality of players that we've improved on because you know there's no denying that Oli's been backed in every meaningful way, maybe with the exception of maybe a DM, which he doesn't necessarily look like he's that worried about or prioritising because, you know, in the three since he's been here so far, we've not really made a big move for anybody. In that position so it definitely feels like it's not really a priority position for him but regardless everything else has been given in terms of the players that he's won is so far maybe the exception of maybe a drillish i don't know but so far we've got everyone we've kind of wanted is maybe exception of maybe harlan as well but we've got ronaldo who's a pretty decent substitute right so if that's the case there has to come a point where maybe the manager's the issue and I think for the other fans especially when I watch stuff like Shefford Paddock and whatnot a lot of these guys are delusional um, I understand it because again Oli is a legend and if you you know if you're if we're all the similar ages and we saw United win you know that Champions League in 99 and you saw Oli obviously score that last minute equalizer and you see the amazing sorry the, the, the last minute winner and obviously you see how amazing he was coming off on the bench and just an excellent service servant all around for United it's no 
it's no surprise that you'd want him to do well at the club, right? I understand it, but we have to be objective and we have to kind of look at stuff honestly and just say he is not as good as a manager or as a coach or as the coaches in the league. That's definitely true. If you have to rank them in terms of tables, he definitely doesn't come anywhere past the Klops, the two shoes and the Peps. It just is what it is. So if that's the case, we're asking a lot from some guy that we all think is pretty average to win a league title and maybe some trophies. We've obviously seen it happen with Di Matteo at Chelsea. He was able to win the Champions League, but it's very difficult to challenge for the league and to maybe try try and attempt to win multiple trophies with an average manager but great players it just doesn't happen you need that x factor you need that little bit extra if whatever you believe if managers are not that important still they contribute something and unfortunately there's something that Oli contributes isn't what's necessary at this top level and we're kind of paying the price at the moment so you know young boys two united one um first game of course of the group we've obviously got some stronger tests well we've got some it now puts unnecessary pressure on the next games going forward like the atalanta and villarreal games is unnecessary pressure luckily with i think both games are going to be at home so that should kind of help us in terms of easing our nerves and probably getting us in the right state of mind to try and put our best best foot forward but we really didn't need to win that game but hey we lost 2-1 it's the first game of the season or first game of the group stages shouldn't be that much of an issue we should be able to dust us off and try again um, and i'm hoping for better results in the next one next on the list we have this weird interesting news courtesy of the shade borough right i'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with it but it's a page on instagram formerly it's similar of course to the shade room which is a black or like a hip-hop um or black culture i guess um hip-hop black culture news blog platform whatever sort of thing right think of like a black tmz that may, mainly exists on instagram and we've got like a uk version called the shade borough and we've got another alternative called uk gossip tv but essentially they kind of highlight and promote most of the uk and some maybe european artists and acts who are popular within the kind of urban landscape right whenever it comes to reality tv music or whatnot and for the most part it's pretty decent like I, I'm, I'm not really that familiar with a lot of the people that they feature because i don't watch tv i don't really watch reality tv and i don't listen to a lot of the music that they, that they kind of feature the artists on there with um obviously some of the afro beats but some of the uk rap stuff i don't really know i'm not that familiar with so i'm kind of a little bit of a casual observer from afar but it is great in that you have a platform where you can find out news about these people who are you know shelling it in their own little things that they're doing whether they're presenters whether they're podcasters whether they're whatever radio hosts djs musicians they're all doing it in their own sort of way but of course because they kind of occupy the urban space you're not going to see them on the bbc you're not going to see them on daily mail definitely not on daily mail right you're not going to see them on all these kind of mainstream platforms so the only way that they can exist are these platforms like a where you can kind of document their lives ups and downs are on platforms like the shade borough and uk gossip but for every reason celebrities in general seem to have a real weird relationship especially black celebrities when it comes to blogs i don't know what it is maybe it's because they feel like the black blogs take more of liberties in terms of what they report about them in terms of their personal lives but it feels like there's a little bit more of a tense relationship between hip or people that occupy the urban space and the platforms that report on them it's not really it's not really warm or welcoming. It feels like I thought the shade barrel was quite good. I thought I think a lot of people, well, some people they feature, especially the girls, would maybe jump into the comments and maybe clarify some things on the story. But for the most part, it was a little bit of a contentious relationship. And one of those alleged contentious relationships was between a kid called Digger D, right, a rapper here in the UK, who allegedly was responsible for taking the shade room page down off her of Instagram. This is what the shade room alleges happened. Um, I guess they reported on the story of Digger D allegedly meeting up with some young lady that isn't maybe his girlfriend. At a hotel that got back to Diggity, he got angry and somehow was able to kind of mass report them or something along those lines and get their page completely deleted. Which, of course, if you're the shade bar and you got 600,000, I think at the time, half over half a million fans on Instagram, that's a legitimate media platform, right? That's a place that you can leverage brand deals and you know promotions and partnerships on the off the back of like that is really crippling. So, the fact that you got it taken down is a real kind of kick in the teeth. But again, I'm just more conf I'm just more interested in the fact that why would you want one of the biggest platforms that is the only one covering the kind of stuff that you do or the area of or the kind of genre of music that you make or the space that you occupy why would you want to take them out when no one else is going to be report no one else is going to report on you or take their space or maybe yeah or take their spot the way that they kind of do the thing because they're all kind of got different voices uk gossip um shade borough made you think they've all got very different ways that they present information but the shade borough was again more of a kind of digestible sort of like shade room-esque kind of platform so it worked for everybody it worked for the girls worked for the guys so to get yourself taken off of there feels a little bit odd 
especially again when you're digger d and you're kind of known as a little bit of a ladies man in that way your people always linking you to the next great lighty model on instagram and whatnot it just seems like you're shooting yourself in the foot because i guess part of the reason why it's good to get on there is because people see your face girls can comment on the picture and whatever they think of your face and maybe that might lead to other situations so it's interesting i don't know what what why this is i don't know what the reason is maybe again like i said black artists feel as if like the black blogs take the piss more than they would for the, their white counterparts i'm not really too sure but i do think it's a little bit of a dumb move a little bit of a backward step in terms of allowing other artists world to have a platform to kind of showcase what they're doing maybe get their name out there you know become viral all that good stuff and you're taking their ability away to do that and i just think it's a little bit you know, it's a little bit r-worded but hey what do i know Moving on here, we've got news courtesy of Mixmag. It says Boris Johnson announces winter COVID plans, including Plan B proposals. No idea what this means. Um, it's probably more confusing um, extra shit that's not really going to add anything to the raving experience. But as long as the clubs are open, I don't care. So it says Boris Johnson has proposed a Plan A and Plan B policy to manage the spread of COVID-19. The Prime Minister revealed plans in a press conference earlier today, maintaining that the although the government uh, was confident that the vaccines were have been have made sorry although the, although he's confident the vaccines that have made such a difference in our lives they could rule they couldn't rule out to prevent and what why can't i read out loud today the prime minister revealed plans in a press conference earlier today maintaining that although the government was confident in the vaccines that have made such a difference to our lives they could not rule out measures to prevent unsustainable pressure on the us and the nhs fine if Plan B were to be needed, the government have said measures such as mandatory face masks, COVID ver 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 verification for venues and 300 people. Sorry, if Plan B wasn't indeed needed, the government has said measures such as mandatory face masks, COVID verifications for venues with 500 plus people and staff being asked to work from home could be introduced. Oof. But still, it looks like they, they're not going to go back to the dark ages where we were prior in Christmas times and not have clubs open. They're going to be open. They're just going to be open with maybe some um some restrictions in place similar to what they're doing now in berlin right i think the cap is like 200 000, 200 200 000, 200 000, 200 000, 2000 and your club has to have like a particular ventilation system to make it work right which of course limits most people but still they're they're not going to go back to the dark age which is good to see it says here on Saturday, Health Secretary Sajid Javid had announced plans to vaccine uh, for vaccine passports to be required for nightclubs and venues. Da, da, da. Although that changed on vaccine passports, Johnson said it's not sensible to rule out completely this kind of option when we must face the fact that um, we still might make a difference between keeping businesses open at full capacity or not. True. The Prime Minister insisted that there were large swaths of the population already having immunity to the virus. Small changes um, can make a big difference and therefore reduce the likelihood hood of lockdown measures awesome and however javid said that the house of commons earlier today if plan b were to fail the government could not rule out national lockdown so there's steps that they're putting in place before lockdown that are going to prevent us going straight back into that horrible lockdown that you know destroyed a lot of people's lives it destroyed my year for the most part in terms of mood in terms of happiness i'm sure for most pe other people they had far worse experience than i did losing family members jobs opportunities businesses i'm sure it was complete shock of a situation um even just having kids at home right when they're not able to go to school that must have been completely a complete nightmare trying to homeschool your kids after all these years must be really really difficult especially when they're like 15 or something imagine that it's like don't you don't even try so i'm just happy that they're introducing these steps prior to lockdown that are going to give us a little bit more of a buffer or a little bit more of an idea on what we need to do to be sensible before the lockdown happens so that we can maybe kind of re retrace our steps and correct course and maybe kind of avoid going back to lockdown again i'm not too mad at that at all i'm not too mad at that at all next on list we've got here courtesy of boxing we've got on the weekend over the weekend actually just passed there were these um thriller fights that happened between holyfield and who did Ivan holyfield fight off the top of my head i forgot it doesn't matter let's read, let's read the thing but the whole thing whole point behind why i wanted to mention it was that surely when it comes to fighting or when it comes to um combat sports there really is not a lot of good kind of like 
there's not really a lot of happy endings, right? There are some, but there's not a lot of them. Most of the endings are like this, right? Where you're seeing Evander Holyfield at the age of whatever he is, 56 years old or so, 58 actually, you know, kind of obviously he's still in amazing shape, a 58 year old, but essentially falling out of the ring after getting knocked out, knocked down for the second time. It's just like heartbreaking to see, especially considering he's like, you know, one of the boxing greats. There's a guy there in the background laughing his face off. But yeah, it says here the following, two former world heavyweight boxing champions came out of retirement, two former UFC champions off face off in the ring and the ringside commentary the, the, this was the spectacle um provided for fight fans at Triller's fight club at the Seminole hard rock hotel and casino in florida top of the bill was 58 year old former world champion Evander the holyfield returning to the ring for the first time in a decade right he, he quit i guess when he was 48 returning when he's 58 years old clearly diminished in some respect because there are videos of him clearly getting chaperoned around by somebody and being told where to go because he's not all there in the head maybe a cte maybe it's just old age regardless he's not in a condition physically mentally i'd say to be in the ring fighting anybody let alone somebody in a professional setting it just shouldn't be happening it's really crazy fair enough if he's in the gym trying to just you know hit the pads and keep himself fit for some sort of way of cognitive repairing himself in terms of his motor skills and whatnot cool but being in the ring fighting somebody is just wild um it continues this year but it was a short-lived return for the man who beat mike tyson twice in his heyday a black one of the victories was best remembered opponents i'll be able to he suffered the first round technical knockout at the hands of UFC fighter Vito Belfort, who again isn't known as somebody with great boxing. So for Vito Belfort, even though he's way younger than him, to finish him in that way is hugely embarrassing. Hugely, hugely embarrassing. After taking a flurry of punches, we sent him through the ropes, then to the canvas before the referee stepped in. Hey, um, um, Holyfield felt that he had been it been a bad call and said that he was kind of sad at the way it ended. He said, "I wasn't hurt." Instead of the 1994 Olympic champion, he had taken the fight as it just eight days notice following the withdrawal of another ring fighter Oscar De La Hoya who had contracted COVID the fight was even moved to Las Vegas to Los Angeles to Florida because California State California Commission had refused to sanction a new headliner so they refused to sanction him because obviously he's diminished and old so they went to a place where you know they don't really follow the rules too much in Florida and are able to approve it it's absolutely diabolical um it actually would have been a far better fight with Oscar De La Hoya because he's younger and he's, you know, he's in, uh, he doesn't seem that he's in a, f he's in that worse of mental shape. But I don't know, man. It actually would have made more sense if they would have had, um, what's his face? Tito Ortiz face off against Holyfield and then have Vitor face off against Anderson Silva in a boxing match. But I guess the contrast worked better in terms of creating a spectacle. The fact that you've got an M MMA guy or UFC guy who's facing against boxing greats, I guess that made a lot more sense in that way. It continues, says right from the beginning, he was not the same fighter. He lost a lot. It was not how Evander Holyfield was Trump's take, which was which is sick as well, right? The, the fact that Triller got Trump to commentate on it was a genius move as well in terms of marketing and whatnot and creating a spectacle. Earlier in Britain's former world heavyweight, um, cruiserweight and heavyweight champion David Hay also made his own return professional ranks with a points victory against his friend and business turned boxer Joe Foyner. And now he wants to fight flipping um what's what's his face? Uh Tyson Fury, isn't it? I love delusions of a fighter. And it continues here. Um, the co main event saw former UFC champion Anderson Silva and Tito Ortiz both now 46 on their boxing gloves. Tito looked far better than Tito. Oh, sorry, Anderson Silva looked far better than Tito. Tito looked like he was punch drunk already. He was stepping into the ring, com incredibly stiff. Um, Anderson Silva, of course, backed up into the corner, was dodging all the punches, inviting all the pressure, and of course, ended up picking him off and essentially eat, making him eat the canvas. It was pretty horrible to watch in terms of a knockout. Face first into the ground. Tito looked absolutely gone right gone 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 so again it just further proof that fighting at this level there really is no good get out of no there, there really there is no good retirement story there's no happy ending everyone kind of ends in this way whether they're in a you know in a wheelchair slurring their words with dribble coming down their chin or they are getting chaperoned around by their best friend in an arena because they don't know where to go. Do you know what I mean? It's just really, really heartbreaking to see. But on the other side of things as well, if this is legitimately your vocation and something that you've chosen as a career path, just because you don't look the best in the ring, but you're still getting paid and people still want to come see you, isn't that the name of the game? You're always going to win and lose fights. It doesn't really matter how old you are, whether you're young or you're old. So the fact that you lost in this manner doesn't really matter in all shape and size because at the end of the day, even though Tito lost this, he could still, 
you know, wipe the floor with, I'd say, what, 70% of the Earth's, of the Earth's population, especially when it comes to men. He still give most guys a run for their money, especially dudes that don't know how to fight. So it's not that big of a deal, really. Do you know I mean, he's still fighting the 1% of the 1%, even though they're old. Um, but yeah, just heartbreaking to see. You would hope that they were the far, but and again, I don't think it's even money. I think a lot of these people, it's just attention. They like to be regarded as, especially if you've lived your entire life being the fighter guy. You want that. You want that acclaim. You know what I mean, you don't want to be the retired analyst. You don't want to be the retired boxer analyst, dude. It's not the same level of attention. It doesn't spike your brain the same way it does to enter in the ring with your gloves on and your shorts and your whatever outfit as you come in with your ring interest music. It's not the same thing. So it could just be these guys love the attention. They love being recognized as the person that they come into the sport looking as and they don't want to let go of that and if someone's willing to pay them a couple of thousands a couple of millions to go in the ring and do so why not why not they've been knocked out 17 million times already as it is before what's another time gonna do, do you know what i mean what's another time gonna add to it talking about knockouts and fighting another really funny interesting story i'm um, leading up to the met gala this is courtesy of tmz conor mcgregor gets into a scoble um with mgk on the vma red carpet really interesting right vma is before the met gala and for some re odd reason conor mcgregor and mgk have got beef which doesn't make any sense i think at the time we saw the picture especially this picture here which is iconic of conor mcgregor stretching out his rather long but short arm in the direction of mgk as he looks bewildered over at him with a massive secure guard in between this is where having security in general as a star is really important because it avoids you getting into these altercations that you just don't need to get involved in because they're highly embarrassing and damaging to your brand you know if if mgk ends up with a bloody nose a busted eye or something and mega fox you know happens to get caught in the crossfire of the blows it's not going to help any of their careers right it's, if anything it's going to be a negative on everybody's career so the fact that you've got some guys that you employ who are there to basically stop and make sure that you don't overdose on your coke and you don't get punched in the face by a former ufc champion is a good thing and it continues, it says, um, the story that originally broke says, Conor McGregor is still nursing um, uh, his broken leg, but the dude already back on the squaring up. Um, he's doing he's doing it well outside, no, he's doing it well outside the octagon and against Machine Gun Kelly. The UFC star appears to have gotten into a physical altercation on Sunday on the red carpet at MTV Music Awards leading into the Barclays Center right before showtime, no less in a would-be clash that was captured by several photos on the scene. You can see here again, MGK looking bewildered, but also... There's, these are the eyes of somebody that might be shook or somebody that generally just doesn't give a shit, right? He's legitimately like, I've I faced a lot of, you know, um, crazy situations in my life. You're not the first, you know, crazy guy to come up to me and try and offer me out. It is what it is. If we square up, we square up. But he's not scared, right? He looks non-scared, which is really interesting, again, because he's facing up to somebody who's legitimately trained to kill people and he doesn't seem fussed in the slightest. Or it could be because he's highly intoxicated. He's super high. I'm not really too sure what the fact is, but big up him on having that poker face regardless. It says, as you can see, there's Connor in a pink suit mouthing off to MGK, who is not very far. The next shot, MGK, sorry, the next shot, Connor seemingly lunging at the rocker, at the rocker as people step in to separate them. Um, CMG has been um, seen uh, reaching for Kelly, but it doesn't look like um, ever, so it ever got hold of him or ever laid a finger on him for the matter. Connor was yanked back by security on hand with a notorious looking furious and animated amid the scrum. And everyone's wondering, what the hell is going on? Why are these two guys beefing? Allegedly, the first story to come out of it was that Connor was looking at Megan, Megan Fox, Megan Thee Stallion, Megan Fox a certain way. But I didn't think that was true because there were images of Connor being at the VMAs with his missus. And I wouldn't think she would allow him to just be oogling at women while she's in his presence. Maybe when he's away on his own, of course, she might say, you know, um, well, I don't know one hurt me. But in her presence, she's not going to just let him just be staring at Megan Fox wearing this flipping see-through dress that she's got on with her little silver itty bitty panty. It's not going to happen. So I didn't think that was necessarily the case. And then allegedly the real story came out which is what they got here on the update which is even more embarrassing for connor and actually makes mgk probably look 10 times cooler than he's ever looked in his entire career and it says here Sources connected with the situation tell us Connor asked MGK for a photo, which Kelly denied and apparently escalated to him pushing Connor, whom we're told stumbled back and spilled his drink. Even though there's an interview after the fact where Connor's asked what happened, he's like, oh, I don't, you know, this um, white rapper dweeb guy, he's basically insulting him. I'm saying, I don't know what the issue is when he clearly knows what the issue. So he wanted to ask for a picture, which would have been quite legendary to see a picture of them two on the timeline would have been super random and obviously something that would be remembered in terms of, oh shit, MGK and Connor McGregor were once kind of chatting 
chatting, you know, and kind of shooting the shit on the red carpet for a couple of minutes. But MGK, for whatever reason, isn't a fan of Conor McGregor and said, nah, right? And Conor McGregor obviously got pissed off because, you know, he got big time by somebody like Machine Gun Kelly. That's why I said before in the previous podcast about when I went to central London and we're walking down the road and this guy who I haven't spoken to in like 10 or five years sees me. And I see him late, but he sees me, of course, from further away. And throughout the entire time he's walking up to, towards, kind of passing us in the pavement, he's sort of turning his face and scratching his beard, pretending he can't see us. And it's like, I'm not going to say nothing to you anyway, because I can clearly see you're trying to ignore me. But I, I didn't even notice him before, but he's trying to do that weird thing. I'm like, I don't get it. I've not spoken to you in five years. Why are you, why are you trying to like air me or like give me the, that big time me? And then when he passed, I was thinking about it for like 10 minutes, ruminating over my head. I was like, what a fucking prick. If I've ever crossed paths with this guy again and I'm in a position where I can authorize his entry or his denial into a space, I'm definitely going to do it. I'm definitely going to remember that and hold on to it like a grudge, right? It's going to be a chip I have on my shoulder. And I was like, this is nonsense. I wasn't thinking of this guy before this interaction. Now, suddenly, in an instant, um, he's now kind of festered in my brain because of something I have no kind of I have no control over. And this is kind of a similar situation. Conor tried to ask for a picture with somebody who he thought maybe would be happy to take a picture of him. He didn't respect he didn't expect that um that reply because he also was expecting someone to say yes. And then of course naturally you get pissed off like hold on who are you actually? Let's let's rewind. Who are you? I thought it'd be funny to have a picture. Now you're trying to big time me now. Go fuck yourself. And then again to the skirmish. But it's just hilarious. And I wonder why. But you know there's one theory because I remember seeing MGK outside oh no sitting um. And watching a few UFC cards, especially this, especially during a pandemic, it felt like he's been to a couple. Um, so maybe he's a big UFC fan in general, and he might be loyal to some other fighters who he's maybe visited and gone to training camps with him or gone to a gym. I don't know, or he might know stuff behind the scenes. I don't know what the deal is, but it just seemed really odd. This is only the kind of reaction that you would get out of somebody if there was a girl involved. It usually doesn't happen that two guys just who don't know each other, who aren't really that friendly, will just suddenly start going into an altercation like this. It's usually those kind of altercations come from something involving money or girls and the fact that this just came out of nowhere is says a lot about connor because obviously it means that he's up for it at any time he's legitimately you know ready for the action the fact that he jumped onto a jet from ireland to go and obviously um confront khabib during that time because of what he did to um what's his face that retired shows what he's on about and the fact that he punched a flipping old dude in a pub because he felt like he was chatting shit to him in the pub it says a lot about him and the fact that he was ready to legitimately throw hands on the red carpet of the vmas in front of the world's press is also proof that he's an absolute nutcase but it also might be proof that he's stardom or that he's pulling power and his notoriety as a legit and really elite level fighter in the octagon is waning and now he's turned into whatever this is right he's turned into this circus this guy that i don't know goes around you know attends the vmas like why is he even connor at the vma i mean shouldn't he be re recovering and healing up or whatever like this isn't really the place that you want to see him at it's kind of a lame place to be for a ufc fire but you know um whatever it is it is we continue um but yeah um what an interesting beef i'd love to see them actually fight and one of those celebrity boxing matches or whatever it'd be interesting if like we find out in the in that fight that mgk has actually got superb hands it's just why he doesn't isn't a fan of connor because he's been training with some elite fighters we don't know that'd be pretty sick but you know so far we haven't really heard that from them so far we haven't heard that we move on what else do we have here we have this weird back and forth courtesy of variety between howard stern and joe rogan which i just don't understand about the flipping I ivermectin the supposed horse dewormer that's that's obviously made for humans that allegedly won a no not allegedly it did win a nobel prize but for whatever reason the media in the usa is just hell-bent on describing it as a horse dewormer as opposed to there is a variant that they've obviously made that's safe for human consumption but the point i wanted to make about this whole thing because you know i don't care about the the kind of um tension that exists between Howard Stern and Joe Rogan because there clearly is you know the fact that Howard Stern represents old radio and Joe Rogan saw the face of podcasting and the fact that you know Howard Stern's never been a fan of podcasting says so some disparaging things about Joe and that there's definitely some tension that exists there between the two which is a shame because I think if they both sat down with each other it'll be a pretty um, entertaining interview or conversation but it's just interesting in America that they have this odd conversation around ivermectin in general, right? It's just really bizarre. Or the pandemic or the vaccine. It's really broken some people's brains. In one part, when it comes to Joe, he went from being really worried about the about the pandemic um, in general, right? He got on, I remember that big 
that big dude kind of fat scientist guy that was kind of um you know really worried about it too and was kind of pointing out the things that could happen really early on um during the pandemic and joe seemed to be rightfully concerned too and then suddenly in the space of a couple of people that were a bit you know a little bit more skeptical about the situation he completely turned and started to adopt this whole like people should be so healthy um lose weight exercise more vitamin sauna um ice bath medication iv drips he kind of uh, completely turned it didn't take that that long either just a couple of episodes in between that first guy he interviewed during the, the beginning of the pandemic and then suddenly he's kind of turned into this guy that wasn't that um who didn't see he didn't believe the party line or the media line that existed out there about the cases he was a bit dubious about how people were getting infected obviously the fact that people are like, getting vaccinated and getting infected definitely threw him off in that regard and on the other side of things howard stern since the pandemic has started i don't think he's left his house right he's legitimately he's turned into a bit of a hermit and he's really worried about it he's always wearing like triple double mask wherever he does have to go outdoors it's really broken people's brains and it's really sad to see really and i think these are one of these are one of the long covid effects look yeah these are one of the kind of long effects of covid that people aren't necessarily talking about what it's done to people's meant to psych yeah, mentally and to their psyche and to their comprehension skills and to their ability to kind of think rationally and all that stuff it's changed it irrevocably it's kind of definitely in the same way that trump broke a lot of people's brains in america because some people could clearly not kind of get their head around why anybody would vote for him and his fans could also can't get around their head why anybody would hate him so there was just this weird conflict that could never be resolved that is still existing now there's still people out in the streets now of america talking about how trump is a legitimate president and biden's going to get kicked out any moment now but this beef is, again signifies the brain broken stuff this is courtesy of variety it says howard stern slams joe rogan for taking ivermectin and shithead anti vectors so now because he's up kind of willing to try alternative medicines which again i don't have a problem with i just think that either people should shut up the ones that are taking ivermectin and need alternative things and drinking ginger tea do it if it helps shut the fuck up and the people that are willing to take 17 million booster jabs to make sure they don't get covid shut the fuck up too i want everyone to just shut the fuck up because it's just getting too much it continues as howard stern has continued to criticize people who refuse to get vaccinated covid19 and he has now say sites on joe rogan after the controversial podcast host revealed he took ivermectin to treat his covid diagnosis rather than get vaccinated um, last week, Rogan ranted on a podcast about the media's coverage of the supposed doctor-approved ivermectin treatment, which the US, which the Food and Drug Administration say could be used to treat and prevent COVID-19. Some versions of ivermectin can also be used to deworm livestock, and they always keep mentioning this all the time. It's just nonsense, right? You can use it to deworm livestock, but you don't. The the ketamine that you sniff in a nightclub, you don't give that to a horse, do you? It's the same thing. It's just stupid. Anyway. The, the thing about not taking the vaccine, if I'm not mistaken, if you get COVID, you can't take the vaccine straight away anyway. You kind of have to get administered whatever cocktail medication you get administered in order to kind of make sure you don't die. And then some time after you recover and maybe you develop antibodies, wherever it may be, then you get the vaccine. You don't get the vaccine after you've got it because that defeats the whole purpose of getting a vaccine, right? Um, it continues here, it says bro who do i sue um uh rogan said what well, they're making shit up they keep saying i'm taking the horse dewormer i literally got it from a doctor it's an american company they won a nobel prize in 2015 for the use of human beings cnn is saying i took a horse dewormer they must know it's a lie da -da -da -da. um and obviously he is pointing out the nobel peace prize was used for parasitic infections however not covid but still isn't covid19 some form of a parasitic infection and if they're finding uses for this medicine that you that worked pretty well for parasites and is working well for covid i think that's a pretty good option to go about especially if it's less strenuous than the other things you get in hospital i don't really know i'd much rather try ivermectin than be on a ventilator of course but you know maybe get the vaccine in general just to kind of protect you but again it's a nonsense debate stern went on to the air on monday and said call that at rogan for taking ivermectin and said all the shit is in our country won't get the vaccination i heard joe rogan saying what are you busting my balls for i took horse dewormer and a doctor gave it to me well doctor also gave you a vaccine so why not take the horse dewormer why take the horse dewormer because you already got covid do you know what I mean? so i don't understand why this is a big deal if you already got covid to seek when you go to the hospital they don't give you the vaccine they treat you for covid and whatever cocktail they give you is what they give you so you can recover and then after the fact you might get the vaccine if you want to but you don't get the vaccine when you get COVID. That's not how it works. So I don't understand this debate. Again, people's brains are broken. He said, um, we have no time for idiots in our country. Stern said, we will, we don't want you. We want you all to either go to hospital and stay home or die there with your COVID. Jesus Christ. Don't take the cure. Don't clog up our hospitals with your COVID when you finally get it. Stay home. Don't bother with science. It's too late. Go fuck yourselves. <laughs> you just go. You just don't have the time. We just have the time for you. 
I don't get it, man, because it's not like COVID affects Howard Stern in the way that's affecting the general public anyway. You know, he can, he gets chaperoned from, you know, home to wherever he wants to go in some sort of black sedan every single day. He has unlimited resources to go and live where he wants. He works in a job or he's got a contract that, you know, again, is, is basically COVID proof. Nothing that he's, the frustration that he seems to have doesn't really come from a real place. What does it come from? The fact that he wants to be the guy that's like, I've got the vaccine. I did it. Congratulations. Bravo. Would it be beneficial or better if Joe could just say I got the vaccine and not be talking about doing kettlebell swings and going to the ice bath? Yes. But it's also pretty refreshing and, and quite crucial to have somebody in the media scape now at the moment talking about how maybe being healthy and living yeah living a somewhat healthy lifestyle and working out might contribute to you maybe not catching COVID because you only got it now and he recovered pretty quickly right he bounced back super fast so there might be something to be said for the fact that he's you know always you know he's kind of in a cocktail of flipping vitamins and steroids and he works out religiously all the time that might have helped the fact that he hasn't really got COVID as bad as anybody else has got COVID but that still doesn't denigrate or take away from the need for most people to get a vaccine because most people in America, especially in America, you don't have the option to kind of go and get all the treatments that Joe Rogan got, especially if you don't have the money. So maybe it might be beneficial just to you to protect yourself and just say, hey, what's the best possible option I've got available out to me? It's the vaccine, you take it and you move on. But again, I just wish everyone would just shut the fuck up, man. But everyone's brains are broken. Everyone's kind of fighting over things that don't make sense. Why is Howard Stern arguing with Joe Rogan about the COVID? They're both multi, multi-millionaires. It doesn't affect them the way it's affecting everybody else in the country they're very unlikely to die even if they do contract a really bad case of it because they have unlimited resources to get treated like they they don't work in in environments that would basically put them at risk like most people would Joe Rogan I think testers every guest that he has that appears on his podcast like they don't it's not affecting the way it is but I guess again because it's happening in the world it's a monumental occasion it's a global pandemic it's something that we're going to remember for the rest of for the rest of time I understand it but some of these these tensions that they have between each other just seems so odd so so bizarre i don't get it i really don't get it and then to make it even worse we've got here a story courtesy of nbc news as comedian snl alum jim brewer council shows that venues co during uh, sorry requiring covid vaccination comedian snl alum jim brewer council shows that venues requiring covid vaccinations the former Saturday night live cast member said the cancellations were due to the segregation of them forcing people to sh not show up with vaccinations so this again i don't know why anyone bothered about this because this only affects jim brew and his fans why do you care he's taking money out of his own pockets and he's denying his fans opportunity to see a show because he feels like no one should be forced to get a vaccine to see a show cool he's taking a moral and ethical stand something that i obviously don't agree with i think it's obviously stupid because you're leaving money on the table you're again disappointing your fans but if that's something he truly believes in let him do it it's literally not affecting anybody else it really isn't i don't see the issue of this but people get hot and bothered about it and annoyed and again having listened to this guy speak on joe rogan podcast recently i think it was maybe joe rogan or the fear of one he's not you know he doesn't seem like the most intelligent dude in the world again you know no 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 shade on him he does appear to be super funny but in terms of articulating himself and explaining why he's you know thinking the things that he does i think he went on a, a few kind of weird anti-vax rants when he was on fear of one a couple of times which just sounded super ignorant it's okay still you can have your opinion no one's saying you can't it's just why can't we kind of vet the information listen to what they have to say you know stand-up comedian da -da -da -da, he gets paid to be an adult clown why should you listen or pay any heed to what he says about the vaccine or about you know going out and performing shows it doesn't matter especially if you're not a fan of him anyway i don't see the point of it because this is legitimately something that he's only directing to his fans he's saying hey fans i know you love me i know you want to see me perform but i have a big problem with what's going on in the world right now and morally and ethically i cannot do this thing because of x y and z his fans will understand it's annoying it's a bummer but they should understand it shouldn't affect anybody else because we don't listen or pay attention to him whatsoever i don't understand why they're caring about it like as if he's some like leading scientist or like a big political figure or something it's not it's just a comedian that decided he's not gonna do a show because he doesn't vibe with this um you know vaccination mandate that's existing so it says a yeah, comedian in silent love da, da, da. he says two quick updates on the shows that you may think you may be getting tickets to or already have tickets to the wilmore theater new jersey not doing it brewer said in a 22 minute facebook live also the royal oak in michigan due to segregation of them forcing people to show up with vaccinations i'm also not doing those shows you would imagine the fact that he's fighting against segregation of his attendees at shows you know where they have to kind of show up
up with papers proving that they get vaccinated should be something that get lauded, didn't it? People should be maybe clapping at the fact that he's kind of fighting um, for people's rights to basically attend shows without having to submit proofs of vaccination, but they're not. Instead, it's something to hit him over the stick with. He's a dummy. He's an idiot. All this sort of stuff. It's just ugh, it's annoying. He continued to said, I know um, I'm going to sacrifice a lot of money, which is true, but I'm not going to be enslaved to system or the money. Brewer said vaccinated vaccinated was a choice and that he didn't care what his fans might have to say about his decision to cancel the shows. He said patrons were being forced and bribed before they could attend shows. If you have anything to say, I honestly don't care. Due to I have to stick to my morals. I have to stick to what is not why I know is right. Brewer said in some cases he doesn't blame venues for enforcing vaccine mandates, but rather governors and ticket vendors. He said venues were being held hostage that's true i think maybe it that's a good point so he doesn't have a problem if the venue said you have to have a vaccine to get into our venue he has a problem with the state and the government enforcing it and making it law that these venues couldn't open or couldn't do business unless people that entered their venue were vaccinated i definitely get the the, 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 the distinction there because what he could argue is that if it was left up to the hands of the venue then he could just find another venue where they don't require it by law and attend there right or he could leave it up to the options of his fans to do right what you want to do in terms of if they come to perform obviously it'll go against the morals if he performs there because he'd get vaccinated himself but i definitely understand where he's coming from again like i said it's only it's only hurting him he's the one losing money in the pandemic in the pandemic years all money is sacred money you shouldn't be turning anything away the fact that he is turning away hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, to stick to his morals and his ethics should be applauded to be honest considering most people don't have any backbone or any kind of spine in anything that they do the fact that he has some semblance of it should be lauded and heralded but again we live in a weird world no one wants to lord and herald those things because we live in a strange world and then to end things and to end things again a sad way to end things finally here um unfortunately norm mcdonald the legend um legendary stand-up comedian and former snl host died at the age of 61 from a long uh, battle with cancer that no one actually knew about he kept it completely secret from all his family and friends i didn't even hear rumors again i listened to a lot of comedian la based podcast stuff and you would imagine the fact that he's at the comedy store the fact that he's a kind of permanent fixture in stand-up comedy in general that you would hear some rumors as a, a, you know in a great you'd hear something um in the great fine in terms of what he's kind of going through but the fact that he disappeared out of nowhere for a prolonged period of time should have maybe rang some alarm bells the fact that he kind of looked a bit weird he looked a bit inflamed he looked like he obviously now thinking back on it maybe he was going through chemotherapy i'm not really too sure but he obviously he was kind of fluttering in terms of how healthy he did and didn't look um but just in general in terms of an artist in terms of a stand-up comedian it's just a sad thing to see especially off the back of the michael um williams um, 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 uh, what you call it news we got as well the other day it's just incredibly incredibly sad but I guess he wanted to go out in this way he wanted people only to remember him for his art he didn't want to be um, he didn't want to have people kind of you know treat him differently because of the condition that he had and I guess they didn't because you know he got if I'm not mistaken fired from a couple of jobs during the time he had this you know this flipping um, horrible diagnosis um, he obviously didn't do his Netflix show. I think was he meant to do his Netflix show? I'm not too sure. That didn't happen. But a lot of things transpired during the time that he had um, the cancer diagnosis for 10 years, which is a long time to suffer through that. So again, thoughts and feelings go out to his family. And it says here, Norm MacDonald, who's our... Um, whose iconic delivery and sharp indecisive observation made him one of Saturday Night Live's most influential and beloved cast members died today after a nine-year private battle with cancer. Okay, he's 961 years old. The McDonald's death was announced by deadline, to deadline by his management um, firm, Brillstein Entertainment, the comedian's longtime producer, partner and friend, Laurie Joe Hoxstra, um, who was with him when he died, I said McDonald had been battling cancer nearly a decade, but was determined to keep his health struggles private away from family, friends and fans, which is really brutal to hear, right? Fair enough, the fans, but the family and friends is like, wow, man, they don't get any chance to kind of prepare to say goodbye or anything right it's just kind of launched upon them like everybody else but again people have that when they suffer through these things they should be allowed to deal with it however they want to and it is somewhat admirable that he didn't want to use it as a crux to kind of gain sympathy as some people would have done um especially if they're scared and they're worried they want as many people to kind of worry about them as possible the fact that he didn't do that is something that should be kind of heralded i think it says here he was pretty proud of his comedy he never wanted a diagnosis to affect the way the audience or any of his loved ones saw him norm was a pure comic he 
he once wrote that a joke should catch someone by surprise it should never be panda he certainly never pandered nor will be missed terribly no mcdonald was scheduled to perform in new york city comedy festival in november he was an snl cast member from 1993 to 1988 making his great impact as anchor on the weekend update segments for three seasons and of course as a way to tribute to him we're going to play a quick segment here from the i'm not norm um channel and then we're going to end the show there this is norm mcdonald on the Saturday Night Live doing the weekend update, some of his best one liners and pieces of material from that era. Of course, there's other bits and pieces, but this is definitely the best. Potential jurors for the OJ Simpson case were asked to fill out a 75 page jury questionnaire this week. In the entire state of California, only one person got a perfect score Chow Ming Wu, who after the trial plans to attend Caltech. By the way, you can now purchase a bronze statue of the juice for only $3,395. And for an even five grand, you can buy one that Al Cowlings has kissed the ass of. <laughs> O.J. Simpson's new fitness video was released this week, and hitting the shelves next week, Simpson's newest video, Dorf on Stocking. <laughs> Look at the crowd's reaction, amazing. The crowd is torn. <laughs> According to retailers, the most popular Halloween mask this year is O.J. Simpson. And the most popular Halloween greeting is, I'll kill you and that guy who's bringing over your glasses, or treat. <laughs> <laughs> And the Pope came out with a book this week, which contains a series of essays examining faith and morality in today's secular world and the changing role of the Catholic Church as it approaches the 21st century. The book is entitled, God Himself Told Me That O.J. Is <laughs> the delivery is so good, man. In other book news, Prince Charles released an autobiography in which he states that he never loved Princess Di and that his father pressured him to marry her. The book is entitled, of course O.J. did it. I mean, <laughs> in his book, O.J. Simpson says that he would have taken a bullet or stood in front of a train for Nicole. Man, I'm going to tell you, that is some bad luck when the one guy who would have died for you kills you. <laughs> you don't get worse luck than that. We we'll just end it there for now, but yeah, man, what a legend, isn't it? R.I.P. Norm. I used to watch so many of his videos of appearances on like Loose. Well, no, no, was it? What was that? Not Loose Women. What was that show, man, with um, Whoopi Goldberg and stuff, um, where he was absolutely trashing them. Like loads of his talk show appearances were absolutely memorable. I wonder if actually O.J. Simpson said R.I.P. I doubt it, but regardless, Norm Macdonald's a legend. It's sad that we lose all the most influential and best artists creators entertainers first and all the shitty guys hang around forever right they end up hanging around forever stealing a living sucking oxygen out of the room but the actual ones are actually the change makers the ones that actually influence people and you know um provide laughs and joy introspection especially during hard times they're the ones that go first right but the shitty ones the ones that are the hackiest they hang around forever and ever and ever ever right like a like a like a bad smell they don't go away it's absolutely heartbreaking. But again, Norm MacDonald, um, he went out with Norm MacDonald. Norm MacDonald, he went out the way he wanted to go out. Sad that he couldn't share his diagnosis with his family and friends so that they could kind of, you know, comfort him in that time. But I guess he wanted to do it that way. And I'm sure he was able um, to especially privately do that probably behind the scenes. We probably have no idea about that, which I'm glad it didn't come out in that way. And he went out dignified, came in dignified. And yeah, he's a legend, man. R.I.P. to the GOAT. R.I.P. to the GOAT. That's the episode 495 Degas and Singer Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. But until then, make sure you smash the like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below your comments, thoughts, opinions on my content. And I'll see you again very, very soon. Of course, a five-star review of my podcast would be much appreciated. But, between, but until then, peace. <laughs>